and it's one o'clock and we have a fantastic thought leader panel here today with amazing uh, people and I'm going to use this microphone as an Indian talking stick when I ask uh, the audience some questions or the the thought leader panel some questions and then uh, after some time I will pass on the mic to you so that you can also ask questions to uh, these people on stage so we, we involve you as well so the first thing that I would like to talk about is the theme for this conference 17 years later individuals and interactions over processes and tools Looking back um, on this time since the Agile Manifesto was created, how come we still did not change most organizations' way of treating people and appreciating them more than processes and tools? Would anyone like to start to elaborate on that? Yeah, a lot of the resistance to change has to do with the thirst for power. So uh, neuroscience tells us, uh, Ian Robertson wrote a book called The Winter Effect, How Power Affects the Brain, and apparently when individuals exercise command authority, they get a shot of dopamine in the brain, become literally addicted to power. So how do you uh, overcome biology? Another researcher, Dr. Keltner at the University of California, Berkeley, has done a lot of research on uh, power politics and, and power uh, neurology and there is a lot of biology around this and it's really hard to change you know a basic human behavior so uh, one way to do it is to introduce what Dave Snowden talked about which is constraints uh, if you can't exercise command authority in an organization then you can't do it and so you have to figure out other ways to work with human beings mm. yeah, I think part of the problem is agile is actually all about um, egotistic individuals, processes, and tools. Yeah, and it's forgotten about the interaction. I think that was one of the issues. I think the other issue is it exactly followed the fad cycle of all other management movements. I find it amazing that IT people never look outside their own discipline. Uh, they keep thinking they've discovered novelty. Yeah, and I've been through business process reengineering, uh, what we fondly call Six Stigma. Um, blue red ocean strategy I mean and they just come and go all right and each one starts off by promising the solution to life the universe and everything uh, which is every intelligent person knows the answer is 42 anyway so we got that one out of the way and of course they, they create this huge illusion that everything will be transformed and then of course they can't deliver it because they fall back into the previous patterns and people want to make money out of it so they start to codify the structure and it becomes highly structured right and we've got to stop, and it started in the 80s with systems thinking, which was a disaster. Because systems thinking took an engineering metaphor of society. It assumed a society could be engineered. Yeah, complexity assumes it's organic. And in an organic system, you start with where things are, and you see what you can change, and you move things. You never ever say what you want them to be, because that guarantees that won't happen. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, well, um, so my background is more people, so I'm coming from a more psychotherapeutic background than organizations. And there's two things I wanted to talk about. One is reasonableness and common sense, and the other one is around power. And I think I'm repeating myself from the panel last year, Doug, but I worked for some years with children at risk, and there was two categories, broadly speaking. One was those kids who were, they'd been so downtrodden by power that their strategy was to never own it for themselves. So they were like victims and they, they perpetuated that victimization. And on the other side, there were these kids who had made the choice to disown vulnerability and identify with power instead. And the basic rule was be power, more powerful than anybody else so as to never feel the pain of whatever wounds they experienced. And what I found was that those children that were identified with vulnerability were so much more able to have a conversation about how it might serve them to be more powerful, were they to have the courage to do so in the safety, an environment where it was safe. And on the other side were the kids identified with power, and it was very difficult for them to conceive in any way why it might ever be useful as a human being to be vulnerable. Yeah. And so they, they remained in a state of, of 
they were out of relationship. There was no intimacy and no, no contact. So I think that was one thing. And the other story is my son. He's seven years old. And from since he was very young, I'd say to him, son, I'm going to tell you some, really, some crap sometimes. You know, I'm going to suggest you do this and that. And sometimes there's a good reason and sometimes there's not. And I'm just repeating some archaic ideology that I brought into. So I said, ask me why if you don't like what I'm telling you. And now he's seven years old and I can't tell him a thing without him saying, give me a reason. If in any way it doesn't fit with his needs. And I think that says something. It's like reasonableness. It's like people are willing to change when there's a good reason. Yeah, but there's a bloody good reason why people don't want to change sometimes. And it's important to remember the humanity behind some of these strategies. And of course, when we talk about HR and, and leadership uh, for decades and even centuries, we've been trained that certain things are going to get certain results and other ways of doing it are not going to get us that result. Just think about the carrot and stick approach. We've been trained, we need to give the carrot, we need to give the stick and then we're going to get, um, get the results. If we don't do that, we're not going to get performance, we're not going to get results. And now in, a, in Agile and, and other firm ways of thinking, we say no, we challenge that. If you tap into the intrinsic motivation of people, you get far more than just ticking off the boxes and, and, and giving you something. So we are challenging the way we are supposed to look at things, but we are still looking at it from our existing uh, context, from our existing um, way of, of thinking and behavior. And we are asking people to actually change that. And of course, in hindsight, it's very easy. Having emerged, been emerged in the Agile um, movement, it's easy for us to see why it works. And that's the only way it, ha it, it can work. But it's more difficult to look at it um, when you've not had that immersion and not have the experience of actually living and breathing, breathing actual values. Mm. For me, I look at it in terms of the fingerprints of history. So going back to uh, in the Industrial Revolution, going into scientific management and Taylorism, going into uh, uh, globalization, uh, there are certain organizational patterns that allowed for scale by treating people as resources, as, as swappable commodities. Now, we've always lived in a VUCA world, right? but uh, true, I hate the word, but I will use it, innovation occurs through individuals and interactions, through scientists, through, through, through actual people coming up with something that's new. But those who follow and those who scale do so through the, 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 the muscle power, whether it's the mind muscle or the physical muscle of just a large number of people. And the easiest way, not the best, but the easiest way of getting that done is not through individual's interactions, but through strict process and dogma and, and everything else. We see that in Agile today where the innovation around Agile, yes, in the software world, but also in business and in other domains as well, is very much following by rote what has been done. So the innovation is coming in pockets, and then everyone else is going, oh, I'll take some of that. Thank you very much. And when they do that, right, they're, just, they're just following. Right? And there's nothing wrong with following, but they're not allowing the, those individuals and interactions to occur in their organizations. Yeah, I think we need to be careful here. I mean, agile people sometimes remind me of evangelical Christians at the <laughs> extreme end of the spectrum, all right? They, they, they basically believe if everybody came to Jesus, or rather came to the agile manifesto, then the world would be transformed. And their job is to talk about that and not actually do things, yeah? And sorry, as a good Catholic Marxist here, we need more justification by works, not by faith alone. Right? The reality is Agile has largely failed. It made a difference for a period, and now it's lapsed into things like safe and less and certification schemes. And now the coaches are trying to do the same to HR because that market is drying up, because Agile has now become highly commodified. And when something becomes commodified, it's at the end of its natural life cycle, which means there's space for new things to come in. Right? And that, that's actually good news in some ways. The others need to be careful here. I mean, I taught leadership with Peter Drucker, which was a huge privilege. Yeah? Um, one of the things we were agreed on is that scientific management and complexity have one major thing in common. They valued human judgment. Systems thinking tried to get rid of human judgment. Yeah? It, you basically, if you look at scientific management, the assumption is you will join a company, you will go through an apprentice scheme, 
Yeah, you will be part of that company. And yes, some people will have shit jobs, but actually they've got other chances in that. But there was a respect for human judgment with automation of physical processes. What we saw with systems thinking was actually the attempt to get rid of that, to remove human judgment completely. And with regret, HR has been one of the major dead hand influences on that. Yeah? I mean, when I, I was started off in HR, to confess my sins here, but it was run by an ex-major from the British Army with three people. And he kind of like knew about rules and regulations, he knew about people, the whole thing worked, people took responsibility. Then it became a profession and we ended up with 35 people in the HR department, you know, our salaries allocated by spreadsheets, you know, a profession which had no connection with business whatsoever yeah, in terms of the way it worked. So I think one of the issues is the responsibility issue. Right? The minute you create a function for something, all the other operational managers think they're no longer responsible for that function because they can delegate it. Right? Yeah. So what will be the role of HR in the future then? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have HR, so um, <laughs> hopefully it goes away. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, HR came into existence because uh, managers want to get rid of the term personnel, as in personnel departments, because they thought that sounded too soft and fuzzy, and they wanted to lay people off in the re-engineering craze. So um, we have human resources. And what, what's happened is that we have this language that's so deeply embedded in our culture that it's very dehumanizing. And we've got to change it. Uh, Henry Mintzberg said, I'm not a human resource. I'm a human being. Uh, that's his battle cry. We talk about people as direct reports like they're pieces of paper. We talk about headcount as if people don't have bodies. Uh, we talk about FTEs as if, as if people are acronyms. And the list goes on and on and on. And uh, it, it affects the way we think about human beings. So is it that um, HR, management, and consultants are necessary waste? Is that a good term for these groups of people? One of those words was right. Necessary waste, yeah, <laughs> because the world is not perfect. Uh, so, let's look at America, for example, one of the most litigious organization, uh, uh, countries in the world. So, what is the role of HR in America? It is to stop the company from being sued. It's not to look after the staff. It's not to look after everything else. It's to put in place the, all, the, all, those, all the fine print so the company is not going to get sued. Now... Uh, I suspect there's a cultural. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not American. I'm Australian. So there's a, there's, a, there's a cultural thing there. But uh, the waste that occurs in an organisation comes from, in many cases, handoffs. Right? Managers became lazy. I don't want to do that, so I'll delegate. Right? And there's nothing wrong with delegation in its own right, if you're delegating an outcome, if you're delegating an accountability. But if you're saying, okay, HR is going to take that responsibility from me and uh, uh, the project managers will take that responsibility from me and all that's left for me is 16, 30-minute meetings every day to coordinate from A to B to C to D and all my job is is to hand off, then once the organisation simplifies... <laughs> <laughs> Once the organization removes um, those lines in that, uh, in that flow, then yes, it's not a necessary waste, it's just a waste. Yeah, there's an old British joke about this because we founded Australia in its modern form by sending them all our criminals. <laughs> and we founded America in its modern form by sending them all our religious fanatics, all right? <laughs> And kind of like, you know, it's like the arc ship for those of, you know, there's, you know, it's, Agile comes there us all the way through in that sense. I think um, we need to be very careful about this. Consultants in their modern form arose on the back of business process re-engineering. Hmm. Yeah, and until that time, consultants were generally fairly experienced people in retirement in partner to consultancy ratios of one to three, one to five, which is effectively an apprentice model and they help people out, right? What BPR did is it drove the market for a large team of what I used to be called ainly retentive polecats, but IBM got upset when I did that. Um, you know, large amounts of, you know, part of the consultant ratio, one to 50, doing mathematical techniques in companies. 
which meant we had a manufacturing model, not an apprentice model of consulting. And the big consultancies have seized on Agile because it's the next thing they can run that model on. That's why I say when the big consultants take it, it's over, guys. Yeah? Yeah, you've got to move somewhere else. Right? I think the other thing which worries me deeply is I, like many people, thought that when HR... HR was the only department in a company which grew with effectively a promotion route for women. And many of us thought that would change things. But if you wanted any evidence that context determines things more than gender, it's HR. Um, because HR has become the most ainly retentive, control-based part of any organization, despite the fact it's largely populated by people with female gender. And I think what that teaches us is context determines the man stroke woman. You know, we need to change the context yeah, more than the people. And I think HR needs to become a distributed nodal function, not a centralized function. Oh, and by the way, they don't like HR anymore. That's unfashionable. That they now think they're organizational change designers or something like that. It changes every two or three years. So, so what then should HR's role be in an agile transformation? They should be midwives, not consultants. It's, it's midwives? A yeah. The, okay. the midwife goes into your home, helps you give birth, and, and then slinks out afterwards. The consultant throws you onto the operating table, produces the baby, and claims the credit. Yeah. <laughs> so start to think of yourself as a midwife, not a consultant. Okay. So obviously coming back to HR, yes, HR is not going to exist in the form it is today, um, but there is definitely a, vo a very valuable place for us in, in the organization, but of course it means we have to redefine ourselves. I mean, if we look back at the history, it was all about empowering uh, corporations, now it's about empowering people. And of course we have to strip HR of a lot of the stuff that is hindering us today to actually be the champions of people and, and help them. Um, really tap into their, uh, their passions and their intrinsic motivation. And I think it was you, Doug, who said, okay, self-management, tapping into the hearts and minds of people, and that's what we have to do. We have to create those environments that actually help people to do that. But I absolutely agree, the way we've run HR um, in most organizations today, that's not going to get us into the future. It's not going to make us successful. So you're touching on uh, intrinsic motivation and... Uh how do we really create that? How do we tap into people's intrinsic motivation then? I think our, most of our processes and tools, and I deliberately come back to processes and tools, are all set up to actually say, we trust in your passion. We want to tap into that. We trust in your intrinsic motivation. But everything that we're doing, all the processes, all the tools that we have set up, actually show that we do not. We do not trust you and we need to micromanage you, we need to control you, and you only work if we get that carrot and stick out. Yeah. So, uh, for my sins, I also used to work for IBM, and... Uh, the I was conscripted, you volunteered. <laughs> I volunteered. Um, I lasted there two years, so, so not very long. So, so it's interesting, you join IBM, and they, what's called, blue wash you. Right? They, they indoctrinate you into how IBM is amazing. They hire the IBMer, these fantastic, great, wonderful people. And, and they attract people who, who, who fall for that. I, I'm, I'm good. I'm intelligent. They hire great, intelligent people. And then they put them in a box, a tiny box, and says, that's your job. Do not step out of that box. Now, to their credit, IBM right now is trying to change that. They've taken the box away. But it's been there for so long that it's still there. Yeah, I mean, so I was conscripted. They bought the company I worked for. Um, it was the best of times and the worst of times. And it was actually fascinating. I became, IBM at those days, this is before Gini Rometti, it has been a disaster in my view, right? Um, and Sam was as well. I mean, I worked directly for Lou. Um, they bought us to create IBM Global Services. They needed a service-based business. And my job was to try and make that transition. And I had a really good boss because he basically worked out my targets at the end of every year. And if we were old, okay, then we wrote it up retrospectively and we played the game, all right? And he caught doing it one year, so he thought, right. So he said to me, he said, we're going to get the bastards. They said, we've got to get your targets up front, right? And there's an IBM corporate strategy which says the shift to a service organization will cause disruption. We have to protect people doing it from old-fashioned IBMers who won't like it. So he said, right, you're going to do that. So he said, your bonus scheme is $3,000 every time a director of IBM demands in writing you're fired, and $5,000 every time a vice president does it. And he put it into HR, and they went ballistic. <laughs> but he pointed out it was empirically measurable, it was linked to a strategic target, and he had the authority to do it, right? That's a smart goal. And 
There were some brilliant people like that in IBM. But the thing which appalled me is they had to apply their brilliance to work around an over-constrained system. And I sat down and got drunk one night with, I won't say who, because it says there was a lot of Pinot Noir, and you know which, it was, they made me experiment in New Zealand and South Africa, because IBM doesn't regard them as countries, they're too small. And <laughs> I'm Welsh, which means I'm fanatical about rugby and wine, all right? So to send me to New Zealand and South Africa is, you know, please don't throw me in the briar patch, you know, it's, it's one of those, all right? So we sat down one night, got drunk, we added up all of IBM's acquisitions, and we worked out what their value should be based on organic growth. And actually, they'd only just destroyed value. The big companies acquire things, and they destroy value to maintain their pace. And the skill in a large organization is the ability to play games with the system. Yeah? So there's a huge amount of energy going into that, which is deeply problematic. I got a stand innovation at a nurses' conference recently when I stood up and said, there are you know, two things about you guys, which I had permission to do this beforehand. Uh, in Britain, we stopped nurses washing patients because it was a routine task that could be outsourced to somebody cheaper. And I said that was a disaster because when you wash the patients, you had intimacy with them. So they told you things they wouldn't tell a doctor. So you're becoming second-rate doctors, not first-rate nurses. And I said the second thing is all the work we've done shows that you break the rules every day to provide empathetic care to patients and you risk your jobs because you care about your profession. Mm -hmm. And I got stand innovations for both, which rather upset some of the NHS bureaucrats in the room, right? But I could take you to similar examples in large corporations, right? And the issue is, how do we make, and, but I think the key thing is, we can't change this overnight, yeah? If you're starting from scratch, you can design something with the right constraints, but that's a rare privilege. If you're starting from where you are, you have to relax some constraints and you have to create pockets of change which effectively act like, I mean, we do this, all right? We, it, it's, you, you need to create retroviruses. Yeah? Re retroviruses infect the host and change the DNA to match it. And actually, that's the model for change. Because you're not going to change these organizations by telling them they're wrong. You're going to change them by gradually and then occasionally getting punctuated shifts where the moment is right, you can push the thing, yeah? and it will change faster. Yeah, that sounds like a very good approach to change. Can I just yes. briefly try to pull back the last three points? So, small experiments that respond to organizational needs that the current behaviors and strategies don't address adequately creates evidence for change. Mm. So that was one thing. But you mentioned about what's the future role of HR, if there is one. I mean, I heard the, the laughs and, and, and the other thing around intrinsic motivation. And it strikes me that you know, the only reason we cooperate in any way at all as human beings is in service of our needs, right? So there was the, the reason for, well, you can disagree in a minute, Dave, but what I mean by this is <laughs> as, as people, we learned to cooperate together because it created value and it enabled us to achieve things that we couldn't achieve alone. Yeah? And, and so when I think about HR, it's like I've been flipping it around recently to resourcing humans, right? Because I think resourcing humans to be able to better resource themselves. So if the purpose of organizations is ultimately to resource ourselves and from one simplistic perspective to just live as well and as long as possible um, and from an egocentric self, maybe me over you, but from a world centric perspective, like for us as a species to better ourselves, right? Then it seems to me that the future role of HR is about enablement of people to be able to do that better. And the thing that Dave said about that's not a centralized function, that's a nodal function. I think ultimately it's an individual responsibility right? to look at what, what do I need in order to be able to deliver value to the thing I say is important and then to be committed and responsible for doing so. And I'm, I'm very curious why you shook your head there. <laughs> I agree with the motivation behind it, but I profoundly disagree with the underlying construct. Yeah? One of the problems we got in Northern Europe and North America, and it's, it's, it's called social atomism philosophy, is the belief that all society is an aggregation of individual self-interest. If you go to Southern Europe, Latin America, Africa, the Celtic fringe of Northern Europe, yeah, then actually those are commutarian cultures. Individuals are defined by the communities into which they interact and bring up. And the primary identity interest point is, is actually the, the clan or the extended family, not the individual. Yeah? And if you look at that, we evolved not to be brilliant individuals, but to be brilliant in extended network communities. So it's not about changing the individual. I think that's one of the key things. 
It's also what is called neo-Darwinism. I mean, Darwin himself rejected this, but the neo-Darwinists picked it up, and you get idiots like Richard Dawkins who pick it up. Um, and they believe everything is about selfishness. Yeah? The reality is human beings evolved to be altruistic. Yeah? We're, we're, we're very altruistic, provided we've got physical proximity and a degree of empathy towards the system. Part of the problem with the virtual world is people are crueler in the virtual environment than the physical environment. Because, for example, the, um, the, the, the scent traces which allow us to determine trust aren't available to us in the, verbal, in the vi virtual community, whereas they are in the physical community. And there's a brilliant book by some colleagues of mine at Aberystwyth University called Neuroliberalism. And it's an attack on the nudge-based behavioral guys. Because it says what, neuro, what neoliberalism has done is trying to subordinate cognitive science to a neo, neoliberal ideology. And that's still the dominant ideology of organizations. So I think the fundamental thing we've got to change, I think we're agreed on the objective here, you've got to change the unit of analysis from the individual to different types of nodal entity. Yeah? Uh, let me give you, to, to, to amplify what they're saying, it is highly cultural. Um, uh, Gertolf Steder did his... Uh, On IBM, which is a cultural... I know, <laughs> it is indeed. Uh, IBM is a meta culture, <laughs> so his research is dubious as a result. Right? It's been continuing for the last 30 years, so it's grown since yeah, then. I know, it's gone on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he has his cultural dimensions, one of those is individ individualism. Um, uh, but you can see that play out in particular behaviors. Um, let's take sort of negotiation, for example. You put an average American and an average Australian across a table from each other to, to negotiate something, like uh, a contract. The Australian will quite often come out with a better um, outcome, because Australians are highly individualistic. Uh, we operate as one unit very easily. I don't think it makes us overly selfish, I don't think so, um, but it does mean that's our unit. You put a table of Australians and a table of Americans across from each other, right? the Americans have learnt how to form a collective, uh, well in, in this case a collective negotiation uh, approach. So they're playing off each other, they're reading the social cues, they're engaging, and the Australians are just five individuals who are, they have a common goal, but they don't know how to play the community game, or at least nowhere near as well. And so a collective of Americans will, will beat a collective of Australians on average. And there's no difference between us, just the way and the culture that we grow up in. Interesting. There is yeah. actually a biological difference. I mean, one of the most scary things in biology at the moment is called epigenetics. So we now know that culture inherits, and we know the biological mechanism of it through RNA. So over two to three generations, culture can actually change your underlying biology. Right? So don't underestimate this, because it's actually very scary. I mean, the classic case on this, if you give bright mice the children of dumb mice to bring up, the children of the dumb mice are bright. Yeah, now just start to think through the implications of that, and you start to say, we're in training these cultural habits at a biological level, not a sociological level, which is the other reason why change is difficult. I would like to ask an entirely different question, and I would like to have your view on what is success? What is a successful organization, and how do we measure success? What are your thoughts around that? Well, briefly, I'd say that we fulfilled our objectives in our collaboration in a way that we believe at least, is adequate to fulfill the need. <laughs> and for us, it's really having engaged people. So people who align with our purpose, who enjoy the challenging work they've been given and who have that social network within their team, within their organization, and who are engaged. Because if they are engaged, we're going to have better results as a company and we're going to strive to achieve our, um, our goals, our vision. So is success linked to survival? Dave is getting nervous here. Doug, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I look at three pillars of, of success. I look at happiness, harmony, and prosperity. Happiness is individual contentment and, and a feeling of uh, uh, achievement and validity. Um, we talked at Morningstar many years ago about a smile index, you know, we'll measure how many times a day people smile and we'll create a happiness index. 
Um, harmony is teamwork. It's how well we collaborate with each other uh, to get stuff done. Um, and we can measure that in some ways. And prosperity is uh, financial success. Are, are you creating more value for the society and for the world than you're consuming in the creation of the value? And if you're doing that, that's what society calls a profit. And if you have that, then you can sustain the ongoing happiness and harmony. So uh, those are kind of the three pillars. That How do you know at. that you create more value just because you're profitable? How do you is know it, if you is value more linked value? to profitability? That that's the that, that's that's your PNL. That's what profit is. What um, that's the, the the applause society get, gives you for what you do. And if you're creating product, goods, and services, and and society is paying you more uh, for those than the consumption of of uh, resources so that you value. consume to make those, then you're creating a profit. So value is a concept that is. Individually, it's, it's in the heads of, of different people, right? What is value? It, is it always the customer who decides what value is? Okay, so I, this is just from a memory of a distant article I read. It was about uh, renewable energy and, um, and uh, wind power. Yeah? And there was all this like, championing of wind power, and there was these organizations who were super successful. And this article was headed by a half-page photograph of this green lake in China somewhere and talking about the devastation to the local communities and the kids and the toxicity and and I just thought well, what the hell is that about you know because here we are from one side of the planet celebrating and championing this awesome success and and on the other side causing devastation so this brings me back to the thing of human need I was saying about if organizations are in service of human needs then like to what extent or scope do we consider the effectiveness of that operation or the successfulness? Yes. Is it here now in our geographical location and according to our figures? Is it global currently? Is it global thinking 100 years ahead? I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a difficult question to answer, mm -hmm. but it's probably one that should be asked. Yeah. So I'm going to let Dave sit for a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> he really wants his microphone. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to keep... <laughs> No pressure. Okay. T two, two, two thoughts. So, so number one, uh, very practically, um, financial success is an indirect measure of of success, or financial health is an indirect measure. Right? Um, uh, and and my talk in an hour, half an hour or something, is going to focus a little bit more on this, where we look at uh, you're not in business to make money unless you're like a hedge fund. Right? Um, you have another purpose. Now, uh, if you can't measure that purpose because it's it's indistinct, then we use a we use an easier measure, right? A boring measure such as financial health um, to indicate that we are achieving our mission, but the two are not the same. Um, and companies that conflate the two, <coughs> IBM, um, <coughs> struggle. Uh, second point uh, to your earlier question. Um, my organization is the Business Agility Institute. We are a community, we're an outreach, we're a think tank. We provide advocacy for business agility and all these new ideas. Success for us is to go out of business. Like success for us is to no longer be needed. So, so uh, does a company have to, it, Companies need to earn the right to exist. It is not a guarantee. For us, we have a mission. If our mission is successful, fantastic. We no longer exist, and, that's a, and that is success. Shouldn't that be the goal um, for all consultants, all managers, and all HR people to kind of disappear? and make yourself superfluous? Yeah, it's a platitude. They all say that, but they don't mean it, all right? <laughs> so come on, let's get, let's get real about this, all right? Okay. Um, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, apologies for this, but there isn't a New Zealander present, all right? And if, if you don't know, Wales, New Zealand, and Canada have one thing in common, a large, arrogant next-door neighbour. <laughs> so I have a duty for my New Zealand, my Kiwi columns with have an Australian next to me to deal with this, all right? A um, couple of things to make a point. First of all, um, market regulatory mechanisms were fine in the 18th and 19th century when we thought we had infinitely available resource, but we don't anymore. Yeah, and they're actually, you know, growth, growth, growth metrics, profit metrics, market metrics are going to destroy the earth within 20 or 30 years if we don't do something about it. And that's the horizon now. 
I mean, I used to worry about my grandchildren, and I started to worry about my children. I now actually worry about myself. Yeah? Um, so the market mechanism is something we've got to challenge. And things like minimum wage actually don't do that because they fall within the same... The, the, the means of exchange becomes more important than the thing exchanged. Yeah? Some of the work we're looking to do at the moment is to look at the way that gifting works in so-called primitive societies. Because in gifting, it's not an exchange of gift. I used to have this argument in Massachusetts all the time. Uh, they couldn't get the, they, they thought favours were put into a bank. So you put favours into a bank so you could draw them out later, right? Yeah, and that was a market mechanism gone insane. I mean, you argue this with Larry Prusak all the time. Right? If in a gifting culture, you give, provided you give something like a minimum level to the community you're part of, the community looks after you. If you don't gift, you're excluded, and of course, that's death within a hunter-gatherer community. There's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't provide free at the point of entry health care and education in all societies over the world. It's just that we choose to ration it with money. It's because we impose a rationing technique in terms of the way it works. And I think one thing you've got to look at, and it links with the organizational changes you're talking about in effect, right? You've got to look at a different constraint-based interaction basis, and we have got a limited time to do something on that, yeah? In terms of success, I think you know, there's no one criteria. I mean... Success at the moment for me in world politics would be a blue wave in America and the second referendum in Britain. Yeah? And I have hopes of both of them. Right? Um, those are campaign-based goals. Yeah? If you're looking at an organization, I think there are two goals. One is continuity of identity over time. Now, it's very different from survival. Mm. It's actually that, yeah, it's continuity of identity over time is not the thing as survival. The other thing is, you know, I'm 64 now, the other thing is a good death. Yeah, I mean, the trouble with Silicon Valley, you've got people who want to live forever. I mean, the reason they're investing in AI, I mean, they believe in the singularity because they want to live forever. And if you, you know, if, if you believe in the singularity, your brain is ossified to the point where a computer transfer may be possible for you, right? But the idea that there isn't a, a cycle of things by which organizations die to allow something new to emerge is a key thing we need to do. So success can actually be death. It doesn't actually have to be survival. So should we then stop to do um, agile transformations and let old traditional organizations die instead? Is that what you're saying? Well, you, you yeah. can kill them faster with an agile transformation. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to assume you were... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, so shall we let the audience come in and uh, talk a bit also? Anybody has a question? Dom has a question. <clears throat> Who do you want to ask? Yeah, okay. Uh, when you talk about the future of HR, yeah, I, I changed my career from engineering to human resources 10 years ago, and I have heard that HR people want to be a business partner, and I still hear about it. Yeah, like uh, I want to be a business partner, but in the US, now many uh, HR people, they talk about they want to be a business leader. So what do you think about it? Yeah, you think like, with or not, HR people can't go there. You're putting me in a difficult situation here. So most organizations have spent decades and tons of money and resources into building that um, business partner, uh, partner model um, to varying degrees or, and varying success. Um, so of course, it's how do we define being a partner for the business? Are we still embedded in our... HR silo, and the, I'm deliberately using the term silo, or are we embedded within our tribe? Are we sitting with our tribe? Are we connecting with our people on a daily basis? So that's what makes it fly or not. So we should uh, try to think about it in, a, in different terms and redefine who we stand for. And we spend so much energy on getting that seat at the table that we actually forget about delivering value. Because if we deliver value, then people are going to fight for us. They want us at their table, they want us in their communication, and that's how we show that we create value, not by talking about it, but by connecting with people and doing things. Thank you, Fabiola. Anybody else who has, or would anybody else like to, yeah, of course. Just, just, sorry, just, uh, <laughs> okay. just a quick one, because I think you made the really important. It's not what, it's what you do that counts, not what you say you're going to do. And a massive problem in organizational change and agile transformation is people keep talking about what they're gonna do rather than go and do small things and talk about it afterwards, right? Mm. The other thing I think which is critical on leadership is I was a general manager before I became Bortus and then strategy director. 
I wasn't allowed on the general management program until I'd done a year in sales, a year in production, a year in, in, in um, support and hit my targets. And at the end of that, I knew what it was like not to be able to pay your mortgage because you hadn't closed the sale that month. And you can't know that knowledge in abstract. And I think part of the problem with HR is all of their knowledge of an organization these days is abstract, not concrete. And we desperately need a new generation of generalists. And all we're doing is creating more and more specialists. Mm -hmm. Anybody else who has a question? Here, over here is one question. Can you say your name, please, also? Yes, yeah? sure. Hi, Sarah is my name. Uh, well, if I have information and then uh, I rely on those uh, information to make decisions, then I'm thinking analytically and I may call myself analytical thinker. And if I don't have information and rely on my emotions and intuition, then I would call myself uh, intuitive thinker. If I'm good at combining the two, then I would call, call myself a design thinker. What I'm wondering about is in the middle of complexity, the complexity that uh, Dave uh, discussed in his, uh, in his uh, talk, what would be a good thinker? What would be a good style of thinking in complexity? Is it necessarily the case that if I am a good design thinker, then I'm a good thinker in complexity or not? That's the question. Can I make a comment? Thank you. Um, humans are very good at putting ourselves in boxes. And we, we, it, it's why horoscopes are wonderful. Whatever star sign I am, wow, that, they got me because we put ourselves in a box and we identify. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> Taurus. Um, so, so, so first of all, analytics, uh, analytical, rational, blah, 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 it's rubbish, right? Um, we'd never use data, right? We get data to make ourselves feel good. We, uh, a good leader is someone who can synthesize a whole bunch of stuff and just come up with an idea and half of it is just they, were, they lucked into the right one. So I'm, I, I wouldn't go and put, and HR is really guilty about this. Myers-Briggs and psychometric profiles and, and what is your color today and what is your acronym and it's ridiculous. And I think being able to say this is the style of person who is best in this environment is, I think it's highly limiting. Yeah, it's, it's actually worth going to read the origins of Myers-Briggs, both in Jung's rejection of it, which they're suppressing, um, and also its founder, who was really upset by the compromise the Hay Group made to do to make it into a test. All right? So it's worth going back to some of that. There's a recent book being published on it, which is worth reading. I think the answer to your question, I think if you want to be a complexity thinker, you don't create primitive dichotomies between analytical thinking and emotional thinking. Right? It's like that left-right brain stuff, which is really bad cognitive neuroscience. We don't have a left brain which is emotional and a right brain which is rational. Yeah? It's far more complex than that. Right? Um, but we love dichotomies in Western society. We like to make things either or. Yeah? So if you're, and, and we're doing a huge program. We just finished a year-long program on a complexity-based approach to design thinking. Because design thinking has become commodified like agile. Yeah, and it's now a highly structured linear process with certificates and God knows what else. And the scaffolding I mentioned has come out of that process. Yeah, design is a, you need distributed ethnography, distributed ideation, you need nodal, the ability to coalesce interactions between ideas and problems, yeah? Which can then go into a more conventional design process. So if you're gonna be a, a complexity-based thinker, you need to be a generalist, you need to have a wide diversity of intellectual backgrounds and read him because you need thousands of different patterns that you can bring to play. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Can, can I add something to it? Yeah. yeah okay, so I, I gave a whole talk on this last year at Brewing Agile. It kind of blew people away because it was a really off the map of what people would expect at an Agile conference. But it was, my, so my background, Jungian kind of background working around psychology of selves and it kind of confronts the dichotomy of living in a dualistic universe and deluding ourselves into believing we're one thing and not the other and you know the like kind of all human human kind of conflict emerges out of that as does falling madly in love with people but that's another story and um in so i i work with sociocracy and and co-developer sociocracy 3.0 and there's a pattern in there called proposal forming. And what proposal forming does basically is bring people together 
and through contract agree not to fall into our polarized opinions and positions, but to share them openly with one another in response to a, a, a need that we want to address together. And we, of, we often say in S3, it's, like it's not either or, it's both and more. And that's like a simple statement on one level, but when you really dig into it what, it, what it's inviting is that we transcend this dualistic worldview that we have and through learning to embrace in consciousness apparent irreconcilable op opposites, something new emerges, novelty emerges. Yeah. And um, socioxy has got its background in Quakerism, and Quakers had this crazy idea that there might be some divinity in all of us. And so they've learned to sit in circle and not only to kind of espouse their own position, but to listen deeply to one another and listen for the collective narrative, listen for that novelty that emerges through everybody being able to put on the shelf their particular position, honor it, but recognize that, as Ken Wilber said, and there's so many problems with Ken Wilber, but one thing he said that I think is valuable is nobody's smart enough to be 100% wrong, but some people are more correct than others. Uh, and so... It reminded me, you mentioned this in your talk this morning, Dave, as well. It's like, if we're going to be coming together to work with one another, then how to really maximize the potential of the collective intelligence and how to learn to really step forward and bring our own perspective, but at the same time to pay equal diligence and, and respect to others as well and be open to something new emerging that's where well, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, as we say, right? That's beautiful, James. Thank you for that. I have a final question to all of you because we need to round off this panel discussion, although it's so exciting. I'm sure you have many more questions, but there is just not more time right now. We have a speed talk schedule in a few minutes. So we'd just like you all to answer the last question. It's what is your most important message to the audience here of this conference? The most important message that you could give them um, <clears throat> I think it's to respect uh, the wisdom of crowds. If you look at uh, James Surowiecki um, and his book, uh, The Wisdom of Crowds, we have collective intelligence that can make us dazzling and, and find solutions and responses that are absolutely superb and uh, achieve greatness and much greater than we can as individuals. Um, there's a lot of uh, case studies, examples of uh, collective intelligence gathering. Um, he talks about the, uh, the sinking of the Scorpion submarine and, and how he put together a number of different teams and they were able to triangulate and find uh, a submarine that had sunk uh, and uh, it was no, no single individual could have achieved that particular result. So. We have to embrace and respect and honor collective intelligence and uh, respect intuition um, to the earlier question. Um, we all think we're creatures of logic and brain science uh, tells us and, and uh, they've studied people with brain damage to the, to the emotional part of the brain. People can actually think through logically uh, through tremendous uh, problems and, but they can't come to a final decision without the emotional side of the intuitive side of the brain. And so we've got to respect uh, human intuition, human emotion, and the collective intelligence of crowds in order to achieve great things. Great, thank you, Doug. And uh, Evan? No pressure. Um, remain skeptical and uh, try and do good. Uh, if you can keep those two in mind, then you're gonna get individuals and interactions. Thank you. And Dave? I think we're more distributed intelligence than collective intelligence. And if you look at the Scorpion, they, it was a highly constrained distribution of partial data and a probability distribution. So it's not just crowd sensing. It's actually a constrained-based distributed intelligence. So think of ourselves more as distributed nodal intelligence. Yeah? And that actually means you map the present, you identify what you can change, you make changes. If they start to move you in a direction which seems sensible, you reinforce them. Mm -hmm. And stop talking about how things should be and change things now. Oh, and by the way, avoid Wilbur and Jung and people like that, because I'm sorry, we've moved on. I mean, Jung was hugely valuable in his day, but he profoundly influences HR practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, we've moved on so far from Jung in terms of our understanding of psychology and everything else, that the concept of ideal archetypes is actually holding a lot of stuff back. Yeah, and I think all the things you want to achieve can be better achieved outside of that. So, Fabiola, yeah? 
So listen to your gut and be gutsy. So if your gut is telling you there is a better way out there to connect with people, there is a better way out there to engage people, there is a better way out there to inspire and lead people, go with that gut and be gutsy to actually do something about it. Start small, don't try to change the whole system. Start small, make small changes, have successes and build on that. Be gutsy to do it. Thank you. And James, last okay. but not yeah, well, least. I, I would say, like, just to come back on what you said, Dave, I would say do listen to Young, do listen to Wilbur, do listen to everybody and everything, and consider there might be some small grain of <laughs> truthfulness in that. And at the same time, I'd say listen to Dave, because one of the things that strikes me about you, Dave, is it's not, it's not just some hypothesis, right? It's like Dave has committed decades to really doing the research, and what he says stacks up on the basis of evidence. And I think that's really, really important. Empiricism in what we do, like really take a look at what's happening, continually reevaluate what you believe you know on the basis of what happens next, and be prepared to continually evolve and adapt that. And finally on that, it just strikes me, companies are spending billions and billions investment into developing agile operations with more and, and sometimes less success, actually. But what about agile governance? What about iterative and incremental decision making? Because you can't predict all of these things up front. Things are continually changing. We need to be continuously evolving and developing how we respond to things. And when we make decisions that guide what happens next, it's really valuable to come back to them again and again. Start small with experiments you can afford to fail and build your kind of strategies, processes and habits around things that make sense, you know, based on what actually happens, not based on your archa archaic ideology and hypothesis. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.